Well, good morning. It is great to see you guys today. One of the greatest habits that you and I can develop is to be thankful and to be grateful. It really can change your perspective on life, how you look at things. Um, the idea of worry goes out of the way when you begin to be grateful and thankful. And when you recognize what God has made you through or helped you walk through, um, you know, being thankful, even, listen, especially when you feel you can't control something, you know, usually there's something we think we can control. And then you have a teenager and you realize it's all out of control. And, uh, right. And then, uh, sorry, teenagers. Uh, anyway, they're in the front row like, is that true mother? I'm not going to say yes, but it is true. Uh, today we're going to talk about repentance. It's a word that we don't hear as much as we used to. TV preachers don't like it because you don't get money when you talk about repentance. Uh, it's, it's true. Uh, uh, the, so uh, today we're going to talk about this idea and we're going to talk about three areas where we can repent and obey. So the idea of repentance is this idea of changing your mind and it comes from first being convicted of something noticing something, and then asking God, would you change me? Would you change how I look at it? By the way, when it comes to forgiveness, I've met with people before who say to me, I'm not ready to forgive so-and-so. And I say, well, here's a good prayer for you. Lord, help me to want to, to want to be ready to forgive. I mean, you pray as far away as you can or need to and say, God, you change me because that's what he does. So I went to the movies with Kyle and Kristen and Ricky uh, two weeks ago, and we went to the giant theater in Titusville. If you have not been to the theater in Titusville, that is the best theater between here and at least Chulioda, but I'm thinking maybe even to Mims. So, I mean, it's amazing, and it has this huge sc screen that's bigger than this room. It's unbelievable, and so... Um, uh, we, we go and we sit down and we're in the movies getting ready and Kyle's sitting right next to me and um, we watch the previews. You know, they have like 30 minutes. I don't know if you knew that. They have like 30 minutes of previews now and Coke commercials and popcorn commercials and who knows what is up there. And so we're just watching all this and I'm just like, whoa, immersive sound. By the way, if you come to me and you say, Eric, this new documentary's out. You need to see it in the theater. Nay, nay. That, that is watching, I can watch that at home. We watch exploding things in the theater. Things have to explode. I don't need surround sound for Mr. Rogers singing It's a Beautiful Day, okay? So anyway, just so you know, just so you know. So if you tell me, and if the dog dies, don't even tell me to go to the movie. If you do, you will be in trouble the rest of your life. That's, all, that's how it's going. I had a hard time watching uh, 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 College Game Day yesterday. So anyway, that's another story. Look it up. All right. Sorry, Ben. All right, so... Uh, what in the world was I? Okay, so right before the movie starts, the movie, it goes to black. You know how it fades to black before then they play four commercials about who made the movie, and you're like, Ooh, okay, now we get four commercials about who made the movie. You know, they go across water, or there's a moon that pops up with a fisherman on it, or whatever weird thing they've chosen. Right as it goes dark, Kyle goes, oh, Dad, don't you just hate that one spot there? <laughs> And I noticed there is a dent in the top left side. Of, do you know what I'm talking about? That's sad, really. I, I didn't notice it at all. There's a dent in the top left of the screen. And so, yeah, so the whole movie, sometimes I couldn't see it. I'm like, oh, I can't see it. Oh, there it is. Oh, I can't. Oh, there it is. And so... Telling an ADD person about a specific thing right before a movie is not fair or nice or kind, but they are my children, so you still have to love them. It's a rule. And so, um, literally the whole movie, though, I'm there, and I'm thinking, I, I, number one, brain goes, how did that happen? Now, I have no idea what's happening in the movie. I'm just noticing every time it gets dark that there's a dot. Maybe somebody leaned a ladder up there. Maybe somebody threw something. Maybe something fell from behind. And my mind is trying to imagine what happened. And then, then I go beyond that. I wonder how you fix that. 
By the time the movie was over, I'm thinking, maybe an iron and some special spray? I'm going to climb up there and... No, but I'm afraid of heights. Maybe I could hire somebody to climb up there and fix... Why have they not fixed... Maybe I should say something to the manager, which my kids are like, no, you're not. And, and the whole movie, I'm thinking about this thing, right? And it's like in, they say in The Matrix, it's like a splinter in your mind, right? All you, it's like, what, you know... Now... This has a point. Don't worry. Here it is. If you're a Christian, this is what the Holy Spirit does when there's an area of your life you need to deal with. And you can put your hands over your ears and tell him to leave you alone. And by the way, I think sometimes he will. And that's no fun because you begin to lose love and joy and peace and all the fruits of the Spirit. But the truth is, God will bring you back to, hey, here's an area. Here's somebody you need to forgive. Here's a worry you need to surrender. Here's an area of your life that you need to say, God, I'm sorry. Here's a a situation that's going on. Here's a hurt, a habit, a hang-up that you've got to say, God, I'm going to deal with that. And that's conviction. Okay, conviction is noticing what it is, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, what, convicts us of sin and of righteousness. So anybody who says to you, God no longer speaks, and my question to them is always, so how do we get convicted about things? Oh, well, you just read the Bible. Really? That didn't work for the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? And so the truth is we need the power of the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives, to to remind us of things, to notice that thing that we need conviction of, right? And then we have to say, God, I repent, which means I first change my mind. I change how I think about it. God, I want to forgive. God, I want to surrender that area. God, I don't want to be anxious. You said not to be anxious in your word. I don't want to be anxious about this area. Lord, I'm surrendering this to you. So you start with that, and that's what repentance is. That's the beginning of repentance where God begins to change your mind. And here's what's awesome about being a Christian. The Holy Spirit not only points it out, but he gives you the power to overcome when you allow him, when you allow him. And some of that just has to do with surrender. So Jesus, in these three stories that we're going to look at today, and we're going to be looking here today in Luke, as we continue in Luke, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, and we're going to look at three stories. And what Jesus is doing is he's pointing out some things that were very normal in his time. Roman soldiers felt like pride was actually good and humility was bad. And so that was taught the Pharisees practiced that. <laughs> they, they were very prideful in what they did. Jesus calls that out several, several times. So he tells some stories here basically to say, have you noticed this? Have you noticed this? And all three of these things are things I believe all of us as Christians deal with. And if you're not a Christian, I'm telling you, you have noticed these things in other people's lives. And the truth is, when you look at it objectively, you realize, you know what? Those are things I need to work on too. And my hope is, by the end of the sermon, that you'll realize that the reason that Jesus came was to help us to know him. Why? So we could walk in power, so we could live with him in eternity, but that we could also have joy as we walk through and deal with these things in life. And God says, did you notice that? So here we go. Number one. Repent from the desire to be honored. The desire to be honored. I used to joke with the praise team um, uh, years ago when I was helping lead the praise team. um, Everybody wanted to be the loudest in the monitor all the time, all the time. And so it got to be a joke. So I would start saying, more me, more me, more me. And the poor sound guy's like, I can't turn everybody up. And then I recommended in-ear monitors, which they said, well, we don't want in-ear monitors. Well, then don't listen to yourself. You're out of luck. So that was, that was my answer to that. Why? Because more me is normal. Look at me is normal for a child. Notice me is normal. And so what is Jesus saying here? Hey, Instead of honoring yourself, why don't you honor me? Listen to what happens. So when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. Time out. This happened to me last year, maybe two years ago. 
I went to an event for a fundraising charity, and I showed up at the event, and everybody in Rotary, I was in Rotary, I'm in Rotary, and so everybody in Rotary had a table. So, of course, I walked to the table near the front where all the Rotarians are, and I walk around the table, and my name's not there, my name's not there, my name's not there, my name's not there. And then somebody said, I think I saw your name back there, and I literally, in front of everybody, had to walk from the front, the front desk, the front table, big round table, all the way to the back. They didn't even have water on that table. That was like the most... mm, mm. And then I had to decide, was it about me getting a place of honor or what was I here for? Was I really here to support this charity or was I here to sit with my friends? Okay, I'm here for charity. All right, so here we go. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. Been there. The nice thing is all the people serving were really nice to me because I sat alone at a table in the back of the room. It was very exciting. Makes me, I'm looking forward to it. It's this week. This week I'm going to that same fundraiser. So when you notice me post on Facebook, you'd be like, oh, that's the fun. Okay, anyway. It's because they knew I was humble. And they didn't know I would talk about it in church. All right, so then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, and I'm practicing this this week, take the lowest place. So guess where I'm starting this year? I'm going to the back first, unless somebody does this. Then he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Isn't that nicer to sit in the back and have somebody go, hey, Eric, don't sit back there. Sit up here instead of, oh, I'm not up here. This is an amazing principle. I've practiced this. Here we go. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. Now, listen to this. And I talked about this to the kids. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Haven't you ever told someone you're good at something to suddenly find that you weren't? Every husband in the world has said, I know how to find that location. I don't need a map or an address. I thought it was here. (laughs) Never happened? Okay, good. All right. We've all done that where we thought we were good at something. Or we even said, oh, I can do that. You need help with that? I can help you. And then we're like, oh, no, it's not. Oh, Jesus is, is looking at the disciples. He's looking at the people that are with him. And he's saying, hey, instead of talking about how great you are, humble yourself and seek to honor Christ. That's the first challenge. Seek to honor Christ with your life. So it's the idea of what a football player does that scores a touchdown and, and points up, says, glory to God. Now, whether or not their heart is in it or not, that's not my job to determine. But the truth is, that should be our heart. God you get the glory. So when somebody comes to me after a sermon, I learned this, this years ago, they come to me and say, Eric, that was great, or whatever, you know, whatever they, they say to me, whatever follows that, you know, a lot better than your normal sermons, whatever they say, right? That's a, the best compliment is when somebody says, you know, unlike your other sermons, <laughs> thanks. Uh, anyway, so, you know, they give you a compliment and, and a friend of mine said, The thing you say to people when they give you a compliment is, thank you. And at the end of the day, lift those compliments like a bouquet to the Lord. Lord, you're the one. You you get all the glory. Father, I know without you, I'm nothing. And we surrender it to him. Listen to what C.H. Spurgeon says. To repent, Charles Spurgeon, by the way, is to change your mind about sin and Christ and all the great things of God. There is sorrow implied in this, but the main point is the turning of the heart from sin to Christ. And so sometimes we look and we realize that we had things that we were holding on to that we finally let go of. And we actually can be sorrowful that we let something get to us. You ever let something get to you and then later you're like, why did I let that get to me? Repentance is about God. I know you need to change my heart, my mind. I'm going to surrender that area to you. Number two. Repent from selfish giving. 
One of my favorite stories about this, I remember going out to seminary in New Orleans, and I was out in seminary in New Orleans, and one of the professors got up who lived in New Orleans, and he said that, he said that God always checks our motivations. And he said one of his neighbors who wasn't a Christian went out of town, and they went out of town for two weeks. And um, after about a week, it's New Orleans, it was rainy, it was summer, and the grass was really high, and he said, you know... Jesus, I'm going to mow his grass for you. I'm not going to let anybody know. I'm going to do this just for Jesus. So he went and mowed the guy's grass while he was gone. He's like, oh, it looks so good. He said, it was amazing. He said, it was high. It was terrible. It was hot. You know, New Orleans in the summer, just miserable. And then the guy was gone another week. And when he came back, his grass was the same height it was when the guy mowed it. So the neighbor did not notice that anybody cut his grass. And the professor said at first, he was like, well, Lord, it's your glory, blah, blah, blah. But he said after a few days, he started thinking, you know, that guy hasn't even noticed that I cut his grass. He doesn't even have any idea that I do that. And he said, and so one day they were out in the yard and he said, oh, by the way, I cut your grass. Oh, oh, well, thank you so much. And he said, as soon as he did it, he realized, did I really mow it for Jesus or did I mow it so somebody could notice? And the truth is, when you help somebody, when you go out of your way for somebody, there's always a mixed motive we have to be aware of. And God will allow your motives to be challenged when you help somebody and they don't appreciate it. When you do something and no one notices. When you go out of your way to do something and nobody recognizes it. When you're not missed. When you didn't show up that one time and nobody says, where were you? Were you really doing it out of unselfish motives or were you doing it for yourself? Listen to what Jesus says next. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. And some of you are like, relatives? We don't have to invite them? No, that's not what that means. So nice try. Thanksgiving's coming. If you do, they may invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, listen to this, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, when you do something, when you go out of your way to serve somebody, if you're not careful, you'll look for people to notice. And here's what I also know. When you begin to serve Christ and you do what God wants you to do, there'll be times that you start to think these kind of thoughts. I'm the only one who, fill in the blank. No one else serves like I do. Nobody else washes the dishes at this office, right? Nobody else, you fill in the blank, you've all had that, right? Truth be known, if we're not careful, what God's beginning to do, and the reason he allows that to happen sometimes, is for us to recognize, am I really doing it because of love and care, or am I doing it because I want someone to either notice or pay me back or... Go out of their way to say, oh, you're doing such a great job. And the truth is, sometimes, sometimes in life, we have to go out of our way to make sure we're doing some things that nobody will notice. I remember going to Park Avenue in, when it was a really large church up in Titusville, and I was on staff there as a teacher, and I remember going into the office one morning really early, and as I walked in the office, there was nobody there, and it was quiet, and as I opened the front door and I walked past one of the doors, all of a sudden that door to the bathroom flew open and freaked me out, and I looked over, and it was the pastor of the church with a, with a toilet brush, and a rag. And he would come early in the morning and clean the bathrooms. And he did it, not because he wanted anybody to notice, but he wanted to have some things that he did that nobody knew about where he could say, Lord, I'm really just doing this for you. So I want to encourage you. Send a note. Put a, put, leave a gift on somebody's desk at work where they can't figure out it's you. Send a note to somebody and maybe they won't know it's you. Go out of your way to bless somebody in some way where you say, God, there's no payback for this. I'm doing this for you. Now, if you find yourself a week later going, they didn't even notice I cut their grass, then you can check your attitude again. Give unselfishly, especially to the weak. When you go out of your way to serve somebody who can do nothing for you. That's when you begin to really check your motives. 
Such grace is costly. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about this idea of cheap grace. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it cost a man his life, and it's grace because it gives man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. And so even though we're sinners, even though we're messed up, even though we're broken, He forgives us our sin through His death. It's free grace. It's a free gift of God, the Bible says, and yet it's an expensive grace that God gives us. Number three, repent from low-sacrifice Christianity. Listen, if you're a Christian any length of time at all, there's going to come a point where it's going to be difficult to surrender something in your life. And way back, I'll never forget, um, when Ricky was first born. Now, Ricky's 24 years old now. And when Ricky was first born, I'll never forget, sitting at the lake over by Advent Health Hospital in Orlando and looking over the lake, and he's in ICU, and they had just told us that he may not ever go home. That today was going to be the big day, and today we would know more whether he was going to survive or not. And I remember sitting at that lake and saying, Lord, I surrender my son to you. And Lord, if you want to let me take him home and be his dad, I'll try to be a good dad. But Lord, he's your child. So I surrender him to you. One of the hardest things I've ever done. Now, another hard thing that wasn't nearly as difficult was when I thought I was dying. And I was in the hospital with a tube down my throat, looking out the window. And I remember saying to God, God, I'm your vessel. And if you want to put me on the shelf, that's up to you. Because I'm yours. That was a hard prayer to pray, but can I be honest? It was harder to pray that for my child than for myself. And so what area of your life, because if you've been a Christian any length of time at all, there's some area of your life that you have to say, God, I can't fix that, I can't control it, I can't make it change, I can't do anything about it. Lord, I surrender that to you. So what's your worry? What's your habit? What's your hurt? That you need to say, God, I can't do anything about it. I surrender it to you. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father or mother, this is, I'll tell you, talk about that. This is one of the most confusing scriptures for a lot of people. That's why I left it in here. Wife and children, brothers and sisters, yet even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. So Jesus is saying, hate your parents. No. He's, he's doing an illustration just like he did with poke your eye out if you lust. Jesus from the cross said, take care of my mom. By the way, just for those of you who think Mary is divine, if she was divine, Jesus wouldn't have to say, take care of my mother, but just pointing that out there. And so, doesn't hate their mother. What does he mean by that? He means that he's the most important. That there's nothing more important. As much as you may love your wife, as much as you may love your parents, as much as you may love your job, as much as you may love that cool car that you have, as much as you may love whatever it is that you think is awesome, that grandchild, right? Some of you are like, I don't love my children, but grandchildren, that's a whole different, right? Right? He's saying, hey, love me more. And then he continues... And whoever doesn't carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Basically, are you willing to die to yourself, to your own desires, to your own way of thinking, to your own way of doing things? Suppose once of you, one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and not are able to complete it, if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person created the iStore on i4. By the way, every time I've seen that building, I've thought of this passage. Wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't a Christian organization that caused the iStore on i4. I'm like, do you ever read the Bible, people? Sorry, sorry. God bless them. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's able, he'll send a delegation while the other's still a long way off and he'll ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And so the final challenge to you, the final encouragement to you, surrender. Surrender all areas to Christ. What area in your life are you holding on to? You think you know better than God. By the way, 
So much of what we hold on to just hurts us. So much of what we hold on to, worry, fear, anger, it just hurts us. So God, I'm surrendering that to you. And by the way, when you surrender something to God and you do like me and you go and get it, you go, right? You ever do that? God, I'm surrendering that worry to you. Man, what am I going to do about that? Right? And you go and you pick it back up. Guess what? Lay it down again. Just lay it down again. And by the way, once again, if you go back to being thankful and being grateful, it makes it easier to lay things down. So I went to the astronaut high school football game this weekend where they were playing for a championship, so they were told, and they kicked and won the game, and then they allowed the other team, the FS, the high school athletic association, put the other team in the playoff that they beat. But that's another story for another day. But we were at the game, and I saw Mr. Trivet. I had lived with Mr. Trivet, we call him Papa Trivet, in 1987, and I've known him ever since then. He used to be a referee, uh, uh, used to be an umpire or whatever, uh, referee in football uh, for the pro games. He used to University of Miami, all those teams. He did the national championship games and everything. And he was in the stands and I went and sat next to him and talked to him for a little while. And he lost his wife just a few months ago. And you know what he talked about? I said to him, I said, hey, I know you moved into an assisted living facility. I don't think they call it that anymore. They probably call it a life happiness center or something. They just make up names, but you know what I'm talking about. And, and I said, I heard you're living there. And I said, I heard you started a men's table. He said, yeah, yeah. And I got some of the guys doing a Bible study now. And as I talked to him, he was encouraging them to go to a men's breakfast. And then as I talked to him, he walks the bridge every day. And as he was walking the bridge, he ran into some teenagers that started asking him questions. And he started sharing his faith as an 80-year-old senior who just lost his wife a few months ago with some teenagers. And one of them, who's a football player, said to him, you know, I don't understand all this stuff. He said, have you ever seen a football player who points up at the sky and says, thank God? He said, that person's realizing that life's not about them, it's about God. And so he's witnessing to a teenager at 80 years of age. You know what he's doing? Everywhere he goes, he's saying, Jesus, what do you want me to do? That's what it means. To allow God to convict you, to allow Him to show you what's missing. It's not just about sin, it's also about living how He wants you to live, and then repenting, saying, what do you want me to do? God, change my mind. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step. And if you want to surrender your life to him today, I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. What does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus died? What does it mean that he rose again? Why? Why? I know about him, but have you ever surrendered to him? Or maybe you're here today and the truth is you're a Christian. You gave your life to Christ a long time ago, but you've not taken a next step of faith, whatever that is. Maybe it's surrendering anger. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's a habit or a hurt in your life that you need to surrender. Hey, before you leave today, say, God, change my mind. Change me. And allow him to point out those areas of your life that he wants to work on. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. Lord, thank you for conviction that reminds us and shows us what needs to change. And Lord, thank you for repentance and the fact that you give us your power to change. Change our minds. Lord, show us what needs to change in us and change it. Lord, we trust you with all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen.